Hello, I'm going to describe how primary directions are calculated. I've received a lot of requests for me to explain this. The reason I've received these requests is because an increasing number of astrologers are aware of primary directions. They are a very ancient technique. They are mentioned by Dorotheus of Sidon in the first century AD. They're mentioned by Ptolemy in the uh, second century AD. So they go all the way back. Um, and by the way, just a technical academic note here. Actually, what we have for Dorotheus of Sidon is a translation of his book, Translations in the 4th century. Um, but in any case, they are an ancient technique, and they were used throughout the Middle Ages by some of the greatest astrologers of all time. Down here in the third paragraph, I mentioned Johannes Kepler, who was also an astrologer as well as an astronomer. Not only did the, the people I list here use primary directions, but they were involved in making decisions about what they thought was the proper way to calculate primary directions. The fundamentals behind primary directions, everyone agrees about. But exactly how you figure out when these things occur in your life, there are disagreements about. I'm going to explain all of this in, in, you know, in detail in this presentation. Um, how Johannes Kepler, how William Lilly, you, we know William Lilly as one of the great horror astrologers. He also used primary directions for forecasting. Jerome Cardin, the great mathematician and astrologer. I mentioned Ptolemy. Placidus, Nabot, Regiomontanus, you probably recognize some of these names for other contributions they made to astrology. And again, not only did they use primary directions, but they discussed the theory behind it and what they thought was the proper way to get the correct timing of primary directions. Um, so a very important uh, predictive technique that had a long life, the support of many great astrologers, and then it fades out in modern times. Why would all of a sudden it fade out in modern times? Because it requires a lot of calculation and a lot of understanding of astronomy and uh, even spherical trigonometry to calculate these things. Um, in modern times, astrologers uh, didn't don't have that technical understanding, um, and, and so the idea was dropped just because it's too complicated. Along come computers. Uh, and people like Ruman Kolov. I have a quote here from, from his book at the top. You can pause the video and read that if you want to. Um, but, but I've already summarized it anyway. Uh, Ruman Kolov was one of the people who, actually the main person, I would say, who figured out how primary directions are calculated. And he wrote a, a series of three short books um, on how those calculations are done. Okay, one more point on this slide. I just want to make it clear that we're talking about primary directions. Some people have started using the term primary directions for another predictive technique called circumambulations. Circumambulations are significantly different from primary directions. And this is confusing to start calling another predictive technique primary directions. So I suggest that circumambulations be called circumambulations and not be called primary directions. And I'm going to discuss primary directions and how they're calculated and how the timing of uh, these primary directed events occur in your life. Um, okay, point number one. Primary directions are usually calculated in Mundo. That's the main way that they're done. They're also done in zodiac longitude by some astrologers, but more typically they're done in Mundo. And by in Mundo, we simply mean the time that a planet rises. So here's Mars. This is the chart of Donald Trump. I'm making this video in early 2016, and Donald Trump is running for president of the United States, so he's an interesting person at this point in time. Uh, so here's Mars, um, and it, near the horizon, and then about six hours later, it would culminate, just like the sun rises in the morning, culminates at noon, all the planets rise, culminate, set, and anti-culminate, and very roughly six hours, sometimes a lot less, sometimes a lot more, to go from rising to culminating, to setting, to anti-culminating. So just as an example, here are some planets in the 11th house. 
How long does it take for them to culminate? About how many hours after Donald Trump was born will these planets culminate? Well, very, very roughly about three hours because they're about halfway from rising to culminating. They're not exactly halfway. Uh, Mercury, you know, of course is closer, so it takes less time than Saturn and so on. Um, and also the time that it takes um, it can be a lot less or a lot more than six hours. But that's the, in, on average, how long it takes. Okay, so that is the foundation. Okay, so say Saturn culminates three hours after Donald Trump was born, maybe nine hours later it sets, maybe nine plus six, 15 hours later it anti-culminates, somehow that number of hours is going to be converted into a date in his life. And that's where the disagreement comes comes about is how do we convert, say, the three hours to culminate, the nine hours to set into a time in your life? So there's a way of converting that, and I'm going to describe how that conversion is done according to to these different astrologers. Okay, so that's the basic idea. I mentioned some some terminology that you may, may hear, diurnal semi-arcs, declination arcs, nocturnal semi-arcs. These are uh, things that are used to, to calculate how long it takes for a planet um, from the time it rises to culminates, etc. Uh, I, I'm not going to describe that terminology. I do describe it in other terminology, in other uh, uh, videos on the astronomy behind astrology. And, uh, note, a last paragraph here, in modern times, you know about secondary progressions probably. They're, they are the more often used, and they're much more popular than primary directions. Um, but in, the, in ancient times, uh, throughout the Middle Ages and th into the Renaissance, primary directions were used, and which are different from secondary progressions, and I'll talk about the relationship between them uh, in, in this presentation. Okay, now, it takes a planet about six hours from the time it rises to the time it culminates. That's going to be about 90 degrees, not 90 degrees in zodiac longitude, but in something else called a declination arc, or if the planet's above the horizon, called a diurnal semi-arc. Um, but very, very roughly about 90 degrees for six hours is going to mean that the planet moves about one degree every four minutes of time. Very, very roughly, the planet is moving one degree in a measurement system that's a little bit difficult to describe if you don't have the astronomical background to understand it, but don't worry about that. Just um, keep in mind that the planet's moving about one degree every four minutes, uh, and that works out to be about six hours to go the 90 degrees and about 24 hours to spin all the way around. Okay, so what you end up with is that in four minutes the planets are going to move about one degree and in their diurnal motion they're all moving around uh, at about the same speed. Okay, um, all right, now I mentioned this that if you wanted to calculate primary directions by hand without a computer uh, I would say, number one, you have to get used to visualizing these things, which I do describe in the series of videos on astronomy for astrology. I have a lot of videos um, on the astronomy behind astrology. You would study that. You'd be able to visualize it. Then you have to learn spherical trigonometry, and you have to apply the spherical trigonometry formulas uh, to rather complex problems of how to calculate these things um, but the problems can be solved using spherical tr trigonometry. That's just to let you know um, how this is done without a computer. Okay, here is how Nabod, an astrologer whose name is Nabod, calculated primary directions. 
what Nabod said is that one degree of arc along this along this uh, declination arcs. If the planet is above the horizon, it's called its diurnal arc, or usually it's called semi-arc. Half of the diurnal arc um, is called the semi-arc. Anyway, don't worry about the technical terminology, but just to let you know, it's not a degree in zodiac longitude. But there's a way of measuring in this declination arc, and what Nabod says is that one degree equals 1.0146 years of life. And what he did is he took the 360 degrees, divided the circle by the number of days, and he comes up with this equivalence. So basically what's happening, or not even basically, let's just say what, what Nabot is saying is that in four minutes after birth, the planets will move about one degree, and they all move at different speed. Mercury will have its own speed, Saturn will have its own speed, Venus will have its own speed, um, because they're all on different declination arcs. That Four minutes equals a year of life. That's the basic idea that Nabot has. Four minutes after birth is spread out to be a year of life. So it's like um, a clock where the second hand moves really fast, and the minute hand moves slower, and the hour hand moves even slower. So as four minutes of time occurs after birth, that equals one year of life. If you're familiar with secondary progressions, in secondary progressions, one day after birth equals a year of life. But in primary directions, four minutes equals a year of life. Um, and you end up with a similar result that one degree is about a year of life. But it's one degree in the motion of the planets as they rise, culminate, set, and anti-culminate. So let me repeat that. Four minutes after birth equals is stretched out in your real life as an entire year. And then, so if you're born at uh, 1 p.m. exactly, from 1 p.m., to 104 is going to stretch out as a year of life, and then 104 to 108 is your second year of life, and then from 8 minutes after 1 to 12 minutes after 1 is your third year of life, moving continuously, um, you know, spreading out o over your lifetime. Um, so that's the idea of primary directions. It, it sounds a little bizarre, you know, that four minutes after you're, bur you're born spreads out over a year of life, but that's the idea. Um, now, Nabot has a simple idea. One degree equals 1.0146 years of life. It makes sense intuitively. The diurnal rotation of the planets, um, the diurnal uh, movement of the planets, uh, and the rest of the sky does not vary in speed. Um, so uh, it's it, this uh, movement of the planets from rising to culminating to anti-culminating is an optical illusion because the Earth is rotating on its axis. Um, so Mars will be moving at a constant speed uh, from rising to culminating to setting because that motion, that diurnal motion, is not the movement of Mars around the Sun. That's its proper motion. This is the diurnal motion caused by the Earth spinning on its axis, and, mo and the Earth spins on its axis at a very, very constant speed. It only changes very slightly over centuries. So that motion of Mars and its diurnal motion is very, very constant, as it is for each planet. They all have a very constant motion, and so we can have this direct equivalence uh, that one degree is spread out over s some number of years of life. And then Cardan... Um, uh, Ptolemy and also Ruman Kolov introduces a, a method of calculating primary directions are all based on the same idea but a different proportion. Let me go back up to Nabod. His is 1.01 .01 and uh, Cardan is almost the same, 1.0135. It's almost identical, very slightly different. And Ptolemy 
uh, suggests that one degree is a year of life. Instead of this 1.01 blah, 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 some oddball fraction, Ptolemy suggests that one degree equals a year of life. So this is the difference between the different astrologers. They all agree that we want to look at when the planets rise, culminate, set, and anti-culminate, and we want to take the time that it takes for the planet to move through the sky over the day and stretch it out over your lifetime, but they disagree about what the proportion is. That's the only difference. Um, and Ruman Kolov uses the methods of these famous astrologers, and he believes that more than one method works. So maybe one method is correct, maybe several methods are correct, and they work in different ways. And Ruman Kolov suggests that several methods work, and he uses one based on the mean lunar year, which comes out, I'm not going to go into details of how he figured this out, but he comes up with a proportion of 0.9844, each degree is 0.9844. So that's the idea. For some reason, astrologers have this in their minds that as the planets move one degree in their diurnal motion, that's going to stretch out over a year of life. Now, Kepler does something radically different. Kepler introduces the concept of the length of a day into primary directions. As far as I know, he's the first one to do this. Maybe others did it before him. I don't know. But among uh, the calculations that I'm aware of, he's the first one to do it. And this is radically different conceptually. Instead of saying, I'm just going to look at the four minutes after you're born, and that's going to stretch out his year of life, Kepler uses the motion of the sun in right ascension from the conjunction to the IC to the next conjunction of the IC as the basis. So he's going to take the time it takes for the sun to move in one day. How far does it move in one day from conjunct the IC on one day to the next day and use that as the basis. He's going to end up with something very similar where four minutes is about a year of life, but he, but the length of time is going to vary depending on the speed of the sun in its daily motion, uh, and that varies throughout the year. So with Kepler's formula, we no longer have a simple ratio. We must calculate the length of a day based on the date of birth. So Kepler mixes in this concept that we want to look at the speed of the sun over a day to figure out what, how, how to calculate the, the proportion. Uh, instead of one degree equaling a year of life or one degree equaling 1.014, whatever, um, it's going to depend on the length of the day. So we're bring, he brings in the concept of the length of the day. So this stuff gets very complicated. Kepler makes this more complicated by bringing in a new concept. Um, so it's very interesting. Now, why does Kepler introduce the daily motion of the sun into primary directions? Everything is nice and simple. What Nabod and... and uh, you know, Cardan and other people are saying it's very simple, straightforward. We're just going to look at four minutes after birth, uh, um, you know, or, or how long it takes each planet to move one degree. And all of a sudden, he brings in this idea that we want to look at the length of the day when the person is born. Um, we don't know. As far as I know, maybe some historian studying uh, all the writings of Kepler will find out if, if Kepler ever mentions this or if there are any hints about it. As far as I know, th right now, there are no hints about why he does this. Um, maybe there are something somebody could research. But here's an interesting thing. This equivalence of a day equals year is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, there's at least two places where it's mentioned. Here's one quote. 
from the book of Numbers 1434. And I'll read this. And here's a website that has this uh, section of the Bible. But you can get out your Bible and read it depending on what version of the Bible is. The wording will be slightly different, but the concept will be the same. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. Wow. This is amazing. One year for each of the 40 days. For 40 years. A day equals a year. I think this is quite interesting. Now here's Ezekiel. Um, uh, let's read these two um, statements here. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days a day for each year. So it's repeated twice. Um, there are other quotes in the Bible that people feel also relates to this idea that a day equals a year. This is very interesting because obviously the Bible is very old. This is obviously the Old Testament. Um, and this idea that a day equals a year. Was Kepler trying to work into primary directions the day equals a year from the Bible, even though astrologers were saying that four minutes equals a year? Maybe that's where part of the inspiration comes from. Of course, Kepler was a student of the Bible, um, as well as an astronomer, mathematician, and astrologer. I don't know. But, it, but it's interesting. Um, now, this is also interesting. To this day, there are Christians who believe that, the, that in this emphasis of the day equals a year equivalence in the Bible. And most of these uh, students of the Bible, experts in the Bible, uh, many of them are very strong Christians who believe the Bible is the, the word of God, um, Many of them are not astrologer. astrologers. Many of them probably don't believe in astrology, but they share with astrologers who use secondary progressions this idea that a day equals a year. Maybe that was part of the inspiration for Kepler. I don't know. But what we do know is that Placidus, who lives a little bit after Kepler, Kepler lives uh, right around the year 1600, Placidus lives in the 1600s, um, he expands on this idea that a day equals a year. What he does is he starts using the motion of the sun over successive days. So not just how long was the day when you were born, but the motion of the sun on the first day is your first year of life. The motion of the sun on the second day is your second year of life. So Placidus calculates primary directions using a more clear uh, representation that a day equals a year and, and closer to the Bible, where each day after life equals a year. And Placidus also develops the idea of secondary progressions. So he develops his own system of uh, primary directions, where he builds in the idea that a day equals a year of life, and he builds a new kind of forecasting method, a variation of primary directions, where the whole chart moves by a day equals a year. So secondary progressions are really a variation of primary directions. Um, and perhaps Placidus was also inspired by the Bible or inspired by Kepler. We, we don't know. Maybe some historian can determine this. But a Placidus, in addition to being an, an astronomer and an astrologer um, and a mathematician, was also a monk. So, um, you know, my guess is that both Kepler and Placidus were aware of these statements in the Bible, and they were trying to uh, negotiate, trying to resolve this difference in the way astrologers are forecasting, where four minutes equals a year of life, with what it says in the Bible that one day equals a year of life, and they found ways to to resolve this difference and also Placidus to create another predictive system called secondary progressions. Very, very interesting development. Um, 
in, in primary directions. Now, I also have a method of calculating primary directions. I wrote about it in articles in the 1970s, and I came up with another ratio. And my ratio is that one degree equals 1.01177 years of life. So we've seen how um, uh, Ptolemy had a degree equals a year of life, and uh, Nabod has a slightly different um, ratio, and my ratio comes out uh, 1.01177. Where do I come up with this idea? Um, I'll explain that uh, on the next slide, but I also want to mention that I sent an email to Ruman Kolob, and I explained to him my theory, which I'll explain to you in the next slide, and Ruman said he had also come up with that idea, and he mentions it in his book as well. So he says that he came up with the same idea independently. Um, now, I'm going to explain here in this third paragraph, I'm going to explain how I came up with this idea. Uh, when I developed this idea for the ratio that a degree equals 1.01177 years of life, this is not a degree in zodiac longitude. It's a degree in the declination arc, or you could call it the diurnal and nocturnal semi-arcs of the planets. Um, <clears throat> I knew about the mention of the day equals a year idea in the Bible. I knew about that. I had read it um, from astrologers. I think it was Manly Palmer Hall. I, I can't remember who it was, but uh, these theosophical astrologers mentioned that it's in the Bible. I did not know at the time in the 1970s that Kepler and Placidus had also introduced the idea of a day into uh, primary directions, but my theory was that maybe primary directions are actually somehow related to the day equals a year idea that goes all the way back to the Bible. So if Kepler and Placidus were also trying to resolve the statements in the Bible and also what I had even more important to me than the Bible was the fact that I found that secondary progressions worked. You know, as a modern astrologer, I'm using this idea that Placidus came up with I'm saying th this works. A day equals a year. It's crazy. I don't know why it works, but it, it works. Other astrologers have found that secondary progressions work. The, the timing predicts things in people's lives. And I kept thinking, well, I know that, I don't know, but it appears to me that secondary progressions work. In my personal experience, they work. In the personal experience of other astrologers, they work. And maybe somehow they they make a basis for primary directions I couldn't figure it out. I just thought about it and thought about it, and then one day it occurred to me. And what occurred to me is this. If there's an equivalence that a day equals a year, and it appears that there is, from my using secondary progressions, and other astrologers have also seen it, then I, I came up with this idea. A day equals a year. A day after you're born stretches out to be a year. There's like some kind of synchronizing, like the hands on a clock. As one day moves, it makes a resonance with a year. So a day equals a year. In other words, a day equals 365.2422 days, right? The length of a year. And this is a 1 to 365.2422 proportion. If you apply the formula to a day again, you get 3.94 minutes equals a day. Um, but a day equals a year, so therefore 3.94 minutes equals a year. So in other words, a day equals a year, and then if you take this proportion, 1 to 365.2422, and you apply it to a day, you get slightly less than 4 minutes. So it's as if the universe is programmed to say equal, a day equals a year, and it, it loops back in, into itself again. This is exactly the same as how fractals uh, are calculated. You take a formula and you loop back and apply the formula again. So you get a proportion of 1 to 365.2422 applied twice gives you 4 minutes equals a day. I didn't know about fractals and chaos theory in the 1970s. I learned about them later. Um, but I came up with the same idea that's used in, in fractal theory 
that a day equals a year. And this was my way of making one simple concept, a day equals a year, that applies, that, that explains why there are secondary progressions and also primary directions. Primary directions are simply the day equals a year applied twice. You apply it once, you get secondary, you apply it again, and you get primary where four minutes equals a day, and then a day equals a year. You're simply applying this, this proportion to itself twice. Um, and that would explain why there are primary directions. Um, now, I was biased a little bit, you might say, as a modern astrologer who was taught that secondary progressions are, are so important. I used them, and I explained primary directions as a consequence of secondary progressions. The ancients would not, be, would not do that because they didn't have an idea of secondary progressions. Secondary progressions were developed by Placidus. So I think what happened here could be that Placidus made a huge breakthrough. Modern astrologers think so because we find the secondary progressions work. And in possibly I'm suggesting that uh, this concept that goes all the way back to the Bible that a day equals a year is the basis of both primary directions and uh, secondary progressions. Okay, so that's the f uh, concept of primary directions. Um, you simply find out how long it takes for the planet to reach these points and you apply the formula and you get the date. So let's run it. I'm in the Sirius 2.0 software. I'm going to click forecast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to go down here and select primary directions list. And we'll select, uh, well, let's use the um, uh, NABOD and see what we get. We click on OK and there it is. Um, oh, I have some things turned on here. I've got planets conjunct cusps. I'm going to right click to bring up my settings. I'm going to click on this button for settings and I'm going to remove uh, planet to planet aspects, conjunction to intermediate cusps, I'm going to just do the conjunctions because this is the most important. Here's a shorter list of the most important things. Now, when this listing says, let's go to the current time period, uh, say July, July 7, 2013, if I go up according to NABOD's method, according to NABOD's method, on July 7, 2013, Venus reaches the midheaven. Okay, so here's Venus, and it would take that long using the uh, NABOD system of determining the timing for Venus to reach the midheaven. We expect him to have an, a Venusian event. These should be major, major events in the person's life, because this is when the planet's reach the angles. Now when it says conduct the midheaven, is that really conduct the midheaven? No. Are these conduct the ascendant? No. I'm using the usual terminology astrology. Actually what it means is Venus is rising. So conduct ascendant really means rising. Venus is rising. Uh, and Venus conduct the midheaven means Venus culminates on July 7th. So these are actually done in Mundo. I'm using the terminology astrologers are used to, but it says Venus is culminating. Now, According to NABOD, it's July 7. Uh, let's right click, go to the settings. And, oh no, I don't have to go to settings. And let's select my method, number six, and also Ruman Kolov's method. So it does two listings. And here's my method. And what date do I give? I give April 30th. So a little bit earlier. And then NABOD. NABOD said early July, I say April 30. Um, so you get slightly different dates depending on what system you select. Okay, now if I right click and I go to settings, there are also ways in primary directions to calculate uh, planets at intermediate cusps. I'm going to explain to you how these are calculated. You know how to calculate, you know the concept 
behind calculating when Venus is at the midheaven, we use whatever proportion uh, we use, whether it's Nabot or whatever, and we do all this spherical trigonometry, we convert it to time, um, and we get the dates. But there's also a way to calculate when a planet reaches intermediate cusps. There's also a way to calculate planet-to-planet -planet conjunctions. There's two different methods, one using what's, what are called Placidian arcs, another one using a method of Regiomontanus. Uh, William Lilly used the Regiomontanus method, so I call it Regiomontanus slash Lilly. It's really the Regiomontanus. He lived earlier than Lilly, and Lilly also used it. Um, and we can also add other aspects, opposition square trine sextiles. So if I add all of this stuff and click OK and click OK, of course we get a much longer list. And let's just see if there's anything happening. Uh, now I'm, I've got here the uh, Cochrane method and the Kolov method. Here's the Cochrane method. And after all this, down here, we also have the Kolov method. So using my method, if I scroll up to 2016, I wonder if anything happened this summer when, the summer of 2015, when uh, Donald Trump decided he would run for President of the United States. And we don't have a lot here. Pluto, we have Venus conjunct the second cusp on April 18th, Neptune trine Mercury. Um, now, I could time adjust his birth time. Uh, these primary directions are very dependent on exact birth time and see if the dates change. I could also try a different method, the Nabod method or Placidus. If I right click, you'll see all the different methods Ptolemy, Cardan, Nabod, Placidus, Kepler, and so on. Uh, okay, so that's the idea. The last things I want to show you is how planet to planet aspects are calculated and how planets conjunct intermediate cusps are calculated. Now, I've already mentioned that for planet to planet conjunctions, there are two methods the Regiomontanus, Willy method, and the Placidus method. Um, and what's done in the Regiomontanus Lilly method is the, the position of the planet is projected to the ecliptic plane using the same method that intermediate house cusps are projected to the ecliptic plane in the Campanus and Regiomontanus houses. Now this may make your eyes glaze over, it's rather technical, but here I have a link to a video where I describe how, plan how house cusps are projected to the ecliptic plane according to Campanus and Regiomontanus, who project in the same way. Um, basically, w what it is, is there's a great circle which goes from the north and south points on the horizon. It intersects what's called the prime vertical plane at 90 degrees, um, and this great circle is used, and uh, two planets are considered to be conjunct when they lie on this same great circle, the same great circle that's used um, to calculate Campanus and Regiomontanus houses. So that's a little bit technical, but that's how it's done. If you study these other, uh, if you watch these other videos and, and study the information presented there, you learn how that's done. Um, so the position that the planet is projected to the ecliptic plane uh, uses the same method. Um, okay, so I've already explained that. Uh, in the Placidus method, the the um, way that a planet is conjunct, uh, a planet is used using the method of Placidus, which are these declination arcs. And what you do with the Placidian method is you see how long it takes for each planet from rising to, to culminating and culminating to setting, etc. And when a planet, two planets reach the same proportion through that arc, then they're considered to be conjunct. The Placidian method is um, is elegant in the sense that um, you're using the actual arcs of the planets. Uh, and I have another tutorial video specifically on how house cusps are calculated using the, the Placidus method. So you can study, you can watch these other videos, study this in detail, 
this is an entire course in itself. Learning how these calculations are done is very technical, very detailed. Um, amazing that these astronomer, astrologers, figured math and mathematicians figured out all this stuff uh, and would calculate this all manually. And now with a few clicks, we can calculate it in the software. Um, okay, and uh, astrologer Jerry M McCransky suggested that aspects between planets can also be calculated, and we added that feature. So these aspects idea, this is an idea of Jerry McCransky and, um, built upon the basic ideas of primary directions, which have been known for at least 2,000 years, and we added that feature as well. Um, and planets conjunct intermediate cusps is calculated using the method of Placidus, where if a planet is one-third of the way from rising to culminating, that's considered to be on the 12th house cusp. Uh, and again, I discussed this in another tutorial video on how Placidus house cusps are calculated. So I'm giving you the idea of how primary directions are calculated and how the timing is calculated. And there's one other idea in primary directions. If I go back to the Sirius software and I right click and I go back to the customizing, here's this button, primary direction settings. Um, you'll see here um, that uh, we, we have all of these choices, planets aspecting planets, other aspects, um, and when we select the other aspects, uh, we're also going to get the parallels. Opposition, square, trine, sextile, and parallels using Placidian arcs. So you see here for an aspect, P, small letter P, A, S. This means a parallel to the ascendant, and you'll see P, M, C. If I scroll down, we'll see some P, M, Cs as well. Um, so here's a PMC, Sun, PMC, Mercury. This means parallel to the midheaven. So there are parallels to the ascendant and midheaven, and these in mundo parallels are not the same as parallels of declination. They're different. So the terminology is confusing. There are parallels of declination, and there are parallels to the ascendant and midheaven in, in mundo calculations. The parallel to the midheaven is when the distance of the two planets from the midheaven is the same in right ascension. And a planet is considered parallel to the ascendant using the Placidian method, uh, which means that the proportionate distance from the ascendant in the nocturnal and the diurnal arcs is the same. So they're proportionately the same distance from the ascendant. Uh, so these are called parallels, but they're very different from parallels of declination. Okay. Um, and the last thing, yeah, this is my last slide, is there's also an option in primary directions to calculate with and without latitude. So if I go back to the Sirius software and I uh, right-click and I go to settings, up at the top here, you can decide whether all of this is done with or without latitude. Um, the most common method is to use latitude. Uh, but if you say you don't, you don't want latitude, it'll calculate it as if the planets have zero latitude. The latitude of the planets is removed. The idea of this is that we want to emphasize where the planet's position is projected on the ecliptic plane rather than the actual position of the planet. This idea is not as intuitively appealing to most astrologers because you're doing the, the primary directions in Mundo, which means you want to know when they actually rise and culminate. And if you use their projected positions on the ecliptic plane, um, you're not actually using the actual positions of planets. So it's intuitively less appealing. But some astrologers do use the zero latitude option when calculating primary directions. So that's it, my friends. This video is now reaching 45 minutes in length. This is a long video. Um, and maybe a little bit heavy, but I've explained to you one of the great mysteries of astrology. One of the great mysteries of astrology is how are primary directions calculated. It's a topic that's often avoided in courses because not many people understand it. 
so there you have it. Um, uh, you know, I've tried to present it as, as clearly and directly as I can, but to fully appreciate it, you do have to uh, study some of these other things, and I have videos on uh, the astronomy behind astrology if you want to be able to visualize it all. But conceptually, you should have it. You should have the idea. And the fascinating story of trying to um, figure out how to time these things and this idea that uh, one degree of movement of a planet along some arc, whether it's a diurnal arc or nocturnal arc or zodiac uh, ecliptic longitude, that somehow a degree works out to be a year of life, and how astrologers have wrestled with this idea using sophisticated spherical trigonometry and analysis and many different inspiration to try to figure out how this degree got related to be a year of life. That seems to be the underlying concept behind all this. Okay, my friends, thank you very much for listening. God bless. Namaste.